Uh, for a while, early in my boot journey, this was the boot of my dreams. Well within my price range, my favorite service boot pattern, um, but I did hesitate once and then thereafter Parkhurst uh, never had my size because they sold out so quickly. Until last year, they brought it back in the glorious Natty Dub uppers. How you going? Welcome to Bootlosophy and if you're new here, my name is Tech. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands I live on, the Wajit people. This is the Parkhurst Allen boot in Horween's Natural Dublin. It's a really gloriously tan natural colour that uh, pops out under any kind of outfit. And so as I said, it is a service boot pattern, so called because the pattern, the design, uh, looks like uh, World War II service boots of the Allied armies, it, it, American in particular. The characteristics, five to six inch high shaft, uh, in this case five measured from the top of the heel here, uh, a fairly simple vamp, quarters and backstay. In this case a single piece backstay with an external leather heel counter. Uh, it has quite a low profile sole and a low block heel. The Allen, made by Parkhurst, is a tough looking uh, boot but also soften to sleek it up a little bit uh, so that it's not out of place in a suitable dark leather to wear reasonably formally. The Allen is Parkhurst's plain toe service boot. They also make the Capto Richmond boot uh, and recently brought back their Brogue Capto Delaware boot. Uh, I'll put a link up there to where you can watch one of my reviews of the Capto Richmond. The details in this makeup, which I'll go through later, uh, make this a rugged looking casual boot. Here is where I usually suggest uh, what I wear with this pair of boots that I'm reviewing. But I'm going to be a little experimental and take some extra time to go through this particular section of the video. And caveat, I don't work for a living in blue collar work. So these outfit choices are all about casual social living. Tell me if you like the extra detail. So, despite the sleek design, in this makeup of a very patina-friendly, scuffable veg tan leather, it is definitely casual. So, on the one hand, I definitely lean into the rugged side of this boot. So, an outfit I'm constantly wearing uh, this with are jeans, and noting the tan colour, I think they look best popping under a dark pair of jeans. A work shirt pairs well, uh, especially in the browner shades, because brown is a good match next to the blue. And on the upper body, it sort of sandwiches the jeans between the shirt and the boots. If it's wetter and cooler, uh, I'd throw on a warm waxed fuel jacket, like the Huckbury Flint and Tinder waxed Hudson jacket, and I'd finish the look with a beanie. You can also move on from that rugged side and move into a more relaxed casual look. In this case, a pair of faded black five pocket pants, uh, also plays with the pop of colour provided by the Natty Dub and to keep uh, the more subdued colouring I'd also wear up top a darker shirt like this one in charcoal. When it's warmer I'll just roll the sleeves all the way up which is one of the ways I always wear my shirts in a casual situation anyway. If it does get cooler you can pop a white t-shirt under the shirt and wear it unbuttoned or buttoned up. As it gets cold you can just put on a jumper like this uh, bright tan one to again sandwich the tan top and bottom. Ultimately, throw an overcoat uh, over it if it gets really cold. The third style is probably something more smart casual. Pair the boots with a pair of khaki chinos, keeping brown shades together, and on top a sky blue button down, again matching the blue to the brown. If you don't roll up your sleeves, you can always wear this with a brown blazer, or if it's cooler, throw on a bomber jacket or a Harrington jacket in a darker colour. So I hope that gives you a few ideas if you don't wear these boots to go out logging. <laughs> uh, let me know if you like this expanded session. So now let's take a look at the brand, materials and construction. Parkhurst brand, started by Andrew Savisco in 2018, had to move out of his US supply chains and uh, US partner factory when they all shut down during COVID, actually went out of business. You can check out my interview with him up there. 
Luckily, through having good partners and I think being a really great guy, Andrew was almost down and out during COVID when his contacts helped him and introduced him to a Spanish factory. And that in turn introduced him to a range of European tanneries to use alongside American tanneries like Holween and Seidel. I will leave an affiliate link in the description area below to Parkhurst. It doesn't cost you a penny more, but I do get a small kickback if you buy using the link to help me fund the channel. So this is a 2023 boot made in his partner Spanish factory. This one utilizes the 602 last, uh, not the 602M, but I still feel it has a slightly different fit from his Batavia factory 602 lasts. I'll talk about that later. The uppers are lasted over the 602 last and then attached to the sole construction using the Goodyear Welt method. The uppers and veg tan leather insole are stitched to the inside edge of the welt, uh, that thin strip of leather going all the way around the edge of the boot. And then the outside edge of the welt is separately stitched to the veg tan midsole into the rubber outsole. The advantage of the Goodyear welt is oft quoted to be water resistance. Unlike Blake stitching, which stitches the sole directly to the inside of the boot and hence providing an opportunity for moisture to wick inside. As a stitched boot, unlike a glued on sole, it can also be repaired by removing the outsole and then restitching a new one on when you wear it out. The outsole is a Parkhurst proprietary studded outsole with a firm but softer compound making me feel that the grip is actually better on slippery surfaces than day night. The studs themselves are quite grippy and the wells in which they uh, sit mean that they can better avoid dragging dirt indoors. The heel is stacked leather, glued and nailed on and then uh, topped with a rubber top lift. The welt is a split reverse welt where the welt is split halfway through and then the split is pushed up against the uppers for more water protection. The welt is also wheeled, meaning that a hot grooved wheel is passed over it to cause these ridges along the length of the welt. When the welt is attached to the insole underneath, it causes a cavity inside the welt. So this is filled with cork and a steel shank is inserted in the cork, spanning the heel and the ball of the foot. The shank provides basically extra arch support and stability. Inside the boot, there is a leather topped and slightly foam backed heel comfort liner, and the vamp is uh, leather lined, while the shaft and tongue are not lined. Speaking of the tongue, it is semi gusted up to the last eyelet, further providing water resistance, at least up to that level. Like all Parker's boots, wherever made, the stitching is structurally sound, neat and even, uh, but it, it remains rugged looking. <laughs> By that I mean you can see things like um, the, the joint of the, the welt ends. You can see um, sometimes the burnt ends of stitches and it does feel handmade with all the handmade inexactness. It is all structurally sound though, but a Weiberg say would spend a lot more time aligning the distance between the stitches, uh, adjusting the stitch density and finally finishing everything. Horses for courses, I think. I love this more deliberate feel to what is essentially a ruggedly casual boot. The uppers are in this boot what it's all about. This is from Horween Tannery in Chicago and this is their Dublin Veg Tan Leather in natural, meaning that they, uh, there are no dyes applied. Dublin is part of a suite of full grain leathers. It's veg tanned and the first iteration is the veg tanned Essex leather with no other additions of waxes or finishes. They, tend, they then take the Essex further and add waxes to the finishing uh, and it becomes Dublin, uh, this waxy veg tan. They add more oils and waxes and it then becomes a waxier, oilier, tumbled der uh, derby leather. Dublin is steam ironed in the finish to create a smooth surface and has quite a rich pull-up effect. As you can see, even after only a few months of wear, it starts to show a variation in colour and patina. It does scratch easily, but usually you can smooth it over when you recondition, or even when you just rub it with your fingers. It has a veg tan firmness, uh, the temper, but the feel of it, the hand, is smooth and just a little waxy. The antique brass hardware, five eyelets and three speed hooks, set off this rich tan really well. The hardware from the Spanish factory is backed uh, and it's finished really well so that while it doesn't scratch the leather on the tongue, the pressure will still move the waxes around and show deeper colour under pressure. K 
Caring for Dublin is no different from 90% of your full grain uh, smooth leather boots. Keep it clean. Make sure you brush sand and dirt off with a good quality horsehair brush. Uh, and if there is stuff sticking to it, you can clean it off with a damp rag. It's also not a problem uh, to do a deeper clean if you have to with saddle soap, but making sure that you don't soak the le uh, leather under a tap to wash it off. Uh, what you do is you suds the soap and then uh, clean the boot and then wipe it off while it's damp with a dry rag and that'll be fine. Conditioning once every four to six months with normal wear is fine. Maybe a bit more if you're consistently taking it through puddles and rain and, uh, and so on, um, since that sort of moisture could dry out the leather. Any slightly waxy uh, conditioner is fine, and I use Venetian shoe cream. Here's a pro tip. I do like the way Parkers send out their boots without waxing them first. Grant Stone, for example, will apply some wax before they put the boots in the box to send out. In the case of more uh, rugged leathers like this natural Dublin, I do like this matte look. When you apply a waxy conditioner, even VSC, and you're allowed to dry and then you brush off the excess and brush the conditioner into the leather, uh, you can be left with a shinier, glossier look. If you like that, you're done. But if you don't, hit it with a hairdryer and the wax on the surface will be uh, reabsorbed back into the leather and you'll end up with that matte look again while having replenished the oils and waxes inside. If you have any concerns about sizing, you should email Andrew through the website. He's always very responsive and helpful. Like almost all US heritage bootmakers, his boots tend to be a half size down uh, from true size or Brannock measurements. I'm a US 8.5 on the Brannock and I take an 8 in Parkhurst. The Spanish made 602 lasted boot like this one fits me a little different from his earlier US models despite using the same last. Andrew explains that by uh, the fact that each factory will apply, for example, different pressure as they last the boot over the last, or even some factories or individual workers are more even and others less so. Nevertheless, these feel a little roomier in the toe than in my earlier models. The 602M, on which I think all the new runs are now being made, I find even roomier. Not roomy enough to take a further half size down, but roomy enough for me uh, to need a slip-in insole or thicker socks. As for comfort, these have that old world heritage boot feel. Firm but supportive and responsive in the uppers. Uh, they're snug at the heel and, and the waist, but roomy at the ball and the underfoot feel is firm but giving. The leather and cork layers should adjust to the shape of your feet over time as you pressure it down and make it even more comfortable and sure-footed as you uh, break and wear them in. Someone commented on another video of mine that he hated the feel of his Iron Ranger boots uh, because they were so stiff. If you're new to heritage boots, just note there is a concept of breaking in your boots to actually uh, get them to fit you. Now I bought these for US uh, $480 in December of 2023. That compares with say Truman boots at mid 400s to now uh, 500s or low 500s, depending on the leather. I would say that construction quality is about the same between the two. Grant stones are under 400 US, but they have lower labor and infrastructure costs and you can get Parkhursts for the mid 300s depending on the leathers. In terms of construction quality, I think Grand Stone is, is probably better. Uh, but if you like this look, uh, you know, rugged and sleek, um, that Viberg type look, which are $700 and upwards. While living in Australia means postage costs of another 60 to 70 US dollars, ignoring that, I believe these Parker's boots give you a, a good price to value ratio for what you get. So there you go, uh, my review of my long sought after leather in one of my favorite boot brands. I hope you liked it and if you do, please click on the like button which would help me out a ton. Also, if you haven't subscribed, why not subscribe? <laughs> I have loads more boot and gear reviews coming up and if you like what you see, subscribe and YouTube will tell you when I upload more, especially if you click on that bell icon. Uh, until then, take care and see you soon.